In this lecture, we're going to look at the function of the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder as related to the digestive system. Now, they have other, um, <clears throat> other functions as well, perhaps, but, um, but we're only looking at the digestive functions today. So we'll start with the pancreas. The pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine functions. Um, we've talked a fair bit more last semester, though, about the endocrine function of the pancreas, um, secreting insulin and glucagon to help regulate glucose uh, levels in the blood and, and to help get glucose into the cells that will be using it to make ATP. But in this chapter, we're going to focus only on the exocrine functions of the pancreas because the pancreas has cells that are exocrine cells that secrete pancreatic juice, which is a combination of enzymes that are, are busy involved in chemical digestion and bicarbonate ions that are used to neutralize acids and along the way happen to inactivate pepsin. Um, return it to its inactive condition. All right, so let's dive in with the pancreas. The pancreatic juices are produced by pancreatic acinar cells, and they secrete them, as all exocrine glands do, into a duct that delivers this juice to the duodenum, to that first 12 inches or so of the small intestine. And among the pancreatic secretions is pancreatic amylase, it's as amylase then, it is just like saying uh, salivary amylase, it is responsible for breaking down starches and glycogen into disaccharides that can then be further digested. There is also pancreatic lipase. This breaks down triglycerides, the dietary fats, into their component fatty acids and the monoglycerides that are attached to them. Um, nucleases, uh, which are used to break down nucleic acids into nucleotides. So nucleic acids are DNA and RNA, and we can break them down into the um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, uh, that we uh, can then make our own DNA and RNA with. And then finally, there are proteases in pancreatic juices as, juice as well. And like we saw with pepsin, these proteases will break proteins into shorter peptides and on down into amino acids as well. And we secrete these proteases in inactive forms, just like we saw with um, with pepsinogen being an inactive form of pepsin. And then uh, the inactive forms are, are activated in some way um, in the small intestine. So trypsinogen is the inactive form. Trypsin is the active form. And uh, trypsin can then run around and activate chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase. So um, pepsin is in the stomach and in the, uh, in, in the small intestine, we see trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. So when you're trying to remember, well, you know, like if I were to give you a list of things and you had to remember what they make, anytime you see pep or trip in the name, then, you know, those, those two roots tell you that it's going to be a protease. So what regulates the secretion of pancreatic juice? Um, and it is when acid arrives in the duodenum. So remember the stomach contents are going to be really acidic. And as that acidic material comes into the duodenum here, then that stimulates the small intestine to release secretin. And that's a hormone that then feeds back via the bloodstream onto the pancreas to cause the release of bicarbonate ions. And so those bicarbonate ions are then going to be used to neutralize the acid that's found in the, in the foods, the, the chyme that is coming from the stomach. Cholecystokinin is also released, and cholecystokinin feeds back on 
the pancreas and causes the release from the acinar cells of all those pancreatic enzymes that we just talked about. So let's look then now at the liver. The liver is enclosed in a fibrous capsule. So we're going to see this in, um, in many of the organs that are in the abdominopelvic cavity that they, or, and, and even the kidney, which is external to the abdominopelvic cavity. They have a, a fibrous capsule around them. And it even, in, in much the same way that the meninges of the brain penetrate down or, or, or dive down in between the lobes of the brain, this capsule material will uh, dives down in between the lobes of the liver. So we have a large right lobe and a smaller left lobe and they are um, right here they are separated from each other by the falciform ligament and then there are two minor lobes the caudate lobe which is here on the um, posterior of the, li the liver and we're looking at the underside this is the posterior the vena cava here is going to be running along the spine so the spine is right here in this area um, <clears throat> so the caudate lobe to the posterior and the quadrate lobe is here and uh, toward the anterior um, right up next to the falciform ligament so the lobes of the liver are built of, uh, are, are structured around what are termed the hepatic lobules. And uh, what we're seeing here in this micrograph is a single hepatic lobule. Well, there were multiples, but I just circled a single one of them. And, um, and so it looks a little like this. So this is the artist's rendering of what you're seeing here in the, um, in the, the micrograph. Um, the liver cells a cluster around a central vein that acts as the blood supply. All of the blood that is delivered to the liver is venous blood. So um, the, the liver receives the blood after it's been through capillary networks in the small intestine. And so this uh, I should be careful about that. There is some arterial blood supply to it that comes directly from the heart, doesn't go through the liver. But m the, the blood that bears food to the liver, that's the way I should have said it, the blood that bears food to the liver is venous blood because it's been through capillaries there at the, um, at the small intestine first. So <clears throat> the liver cells cluster around a central vein and capillaries then um, form that um, come near to all of the cells. So, um, so the hepatic portal vein is the, the main blood supply that brings food to the liver. And in the liver, they diverge, the hepatic portal vein diverges and uh, forms these central veins that then lead to capillary networks that bring the digested nu nutrients to the liver cells. So all of the blood that leaves the intestine flows first to the liver and the hepatocytes job then is to adjust the level of nutrients that circulates in the blood before the blood makes it out into the general circulation. So the hepatocytes will harbor or sequester um, nutrients or release nutrients depending upon the needs of the body. The hepatocytes also have the, the capacity to fully break down and to fully build many different carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. And so one of the functions that we that the liver serves is to build the plasma proteins that are found in blood. But because the the liver can both fully break down a glucose molecule or an amino acid or a, um, or a nucleic acid or a lipid that, and then build new lipids or nucleic acids or um, you know, whatever the body needs. It has the capacity to inter convert one group of nutrients into 
the nutrient that is needed in the body. And it responds to both insulin and glucagon, either storing up glucose as glycogen or releasing glucose by mobilizing the glycogen stores and carving off glucose molecules from it. So metabolic regulation is without a doubt the primary function of the liver in a normal healthy body because it um, the liver monitors manages and uh, distributes the nutrients that have been gained at the intestine and um, and make sure that the body remains uh, replete in whatever nutrients it requires but there are other functions as well it functions in storage so it stores glycogen it stores iron it stores many vitamins it can filter the blood so just like we saw in the spleen the blood cells have to navigate many twists and turns in the small capillaries that they're making their way through in the liver and so any dying or or dead or damaged red blood cells are removed as well as any debris that might be found in the blood and pathogens too so we have um, a nice uh, standing army of immunological cells, macrophages especially, that are there to remove materials that shouldn't be in the blood. Uh, the liver also participates in detoxification of the blood and body fluids. So there's lots and lots of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in liver cells and the enzymes on the, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum are very good at you know at breaking down they, they are capable of breaking down many of the um, many of the toxins that normally you know just as a part of living will accumulate in the body and then finally the liver is responsible for producing bile and it delivers that bile to the duodenum via um, several tubes that join together to form a common bile duct. So bile is a, is a water-based fluid that's composed of what are termed the bile salts, bile pigments, cholesterol is found in it, and also electrolytes, so salts. Um, the bile salts are used to emulsify fats. So when we talk about fat emulsification, what we're talking about is taking large globs of fat and converting it into small globlets so that there is um, easy access by pancreatic lipase to all of that fatty material. Imagine if we had a bunch of little tiny enzymes here trying to work this very large fat droplet. It would take a long time for them to digest their way to just a little small fat droplet. But if we can break fat into small particles that won't re-aggregate, and fat has a tendency to do that, you put a fat into a watery environment and it all tends to find itself in clump and usually will, you know, like if you're making salad dressing for instance and you pour some canola oil into a bit of vinegar with some herbs in it, then um, <clears throat> all the fat rises to the surface in one big globule and you have to shake it up. Well with an emulsifying agent like the bile salts, the fat once it gets shaken up into small little bits will remain in small droplets. So that is fat emulsification. Um, and then finally the bile pigments are bilirubin and biliverdin which are the byproducts of breaking down hemoglobin. And so um, we are, um, we are, uh, th this is the way that we dispose of these bile pigments um, because they just make it into the small intestine and eventually just get pooped out along with the waste material that isn't um, able to be digested. Okay, so the gallbladder's job then is to collect the bile that is not immediately used there at the duodenum. So we've got two different ducts that lead into the common bile duct. And so bile is here waiting, kind of backed up, waiting for fat materials to be called or uh, to, to help call the, you know, so when kind, 
that has fat and it makes it here into the duodenum, then that triggers the reopening of the sphincter here and bile rushes in and mixes with that fat and, and emulsifies it. But we are, even when we're not eating, we are constantly making bile. And so the bile trickles down from the liver into the common bile duct and then backs up the cystic duct here into the gallbladder. And so the gallbladder will fill with bile but we're still making bile because the bile is just being made constantly. And so in order to be able to hold the bile, the job of the gallbladder is to concentrate, to remove water from the bile so that it becomes very concentrated there in the gallbladder. And that helps to uh, really do a good job of emulsifying when we eat, eat a lot of fat. So that cholecystokinin that is busy telling the um, pancreas, hey, make us some you know, make us some uh, enzymes to help digest the food that we're eating. Cholecystokinin also feeds back on the gallbladder. And so it stimulates the gallbladder to contract and then bile gets squeezed out. Um, the concentrated bile gets squeezed out and delivered to the duodenum. But one of the downsides of the gallbladder and this whole concentration thing that is that as the concentration of cholesterol especially, but other salts as well, rises as, as it becomes more concentrated there in the gallbladder, then that makes it very easy for some of that cholesterol or some of those salts to precipitate out and to become solid. And once you get a little nucleus of solid material forming in the gallbladder, then that becomes a super attractant to any other ions or, um, or cholesterol molecules or whatever is in the bile uh, to be precipitated out onto that little piece of rock that begins to form. So it's a little bit like making a pearl. We just keep adding layers and layers of precipitated cholesterol and precipitated other stuff. And eventually, these bile, uh, the gallstones, and that's what they're called as gallstones, these rocks, will uh, accumulate and become so large or fill up the gallbladder that um, the, the passages get blocked up with these stones. And so that leads to all sorts of uh, digestive issues because you're not producing enough or you, there's not enough bile being delivered into the intestine or the gallbladder becomes enlarged or engorged with the bile that it's holding or, or one of these stones might try to pass, which is also very uncomfortable. So lots of bad things can go down when gallstones accumulate in the gallbladder and so the... Um, Usually, if somebody's gallbladder becomes super inflamed, the only solution is, well, sometimes they can sonicate it and hit it with a bunch of um, sound waves and break up the, the stones, but usually it's a surgery you're looking at. All right, so there you have it. Everything you ever wanted to know about the pancreas, the 